Hi, everyone. Up next, we have Chloe Moore, who is going to be giving her talk on train spotting, real time detection of a train's passing from video. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Chloe. I am a data scientist at Silicon Valley Data Science. Um, we are a startup consulting company based in Mountain View, where we do data science, data engineering, and data strategy work. Um, and we have a slight obsession with trains, um, more specifically the Caltrain. Um, so we go as far back to the first meetings with our founder and initial employees to uh, being right on the Caltrain tracks um, and having a horn blow every time uh, they went by. And then we didn't learn our lesson and had our first office right on the Caltrain in Sunnyvale and in a very, very old building, and had to basically stop every meeting with clients whenever a train passed. Um, we finally moved up to Mountain View, still by the train station, but thankfully with um, some sound uh, insulation now. Um, but as we were kind of, all of us are usually commuting via the Caltrain, and then if anybody, oh, by the way, the Caltrain is, <laughs> sorry, a train in the Bay Area that goes from San Francisco to San Jose. Um, and most of us use it to commute, and it is very um, sporadic. It's very hard to get any updates on when the train will be there or won't be there. Um, and so we've made it a hobby of ours to create an app to predict better the Caltrain, and at least just let us know when we should probably just get a lift home and not um, even go to the station. So this is kind of just a demo of what, what is planned. Um, and just before I go on, I have to tell you, we are, I am not working for Caltrain. This is just a hobby of ours. Um, but we have done some analysis and ended up in some meetings with them um, to talk about their data. Um, and the kind of data that you would need to make some predictions would be kind of arrival times of trains and departure times. Um, unfortunately, that's really not the kind of data we can actually get. Neither can Caltrain, funnily enough. Um, they have a, a contractor who has that information. So the only information we really have is whatever shows on these uh, status bars. They also show on the website that we can scrape um, to get basically a train and when it's predicted to um, arrive and whether it's arri or has arrived. Um, actually, not whether it's arrived. But we have to say that maybe it has arrived and left based on when it just disappears from the website. So this didn't really seem like a very trustworthy source. So we wanted to utilize our location on the Caltrain tracks to uh, actually get some real data as to when the train is really leaving the Mountain View station. So this is a window from our office. Um, we literally live with the Caltrain daily. Um, and so what I'll go through today is um, an algorithm that I developed um, to detect whether a train is passing and in what direction it's going um, using video. Um, so I'm going to talk about OpenCV, which is um, great for image processing in Python, go through the development of the algorithm, talk about real-time deployment, um, and then finish up with some comments on um, the effects of video quality and also the filmed environment. So um, for those of you who have not used it, OpenCV is a fantastic package for image processing. Um, it was written in C and C++, but it has um, both a Python and Java interface. It can be basically on any device. And wonderfully, it is free for academic and commercial use. Um, it can use multi-core processing, and it's just very efficient, especially for real-time applications like this. Um, and just a little pro tip. Use Anaconda to install it if you'd like to try this out. Otherwise, you will pull your hair out. Um, so before I go on and go through this algorithm, um, if you are not obsessed with trains like we are, there are also many other applications of a lot of the things that I'm going to go through here. Um, the best one that I've seen is a guy who hooked up a Raspberry Pi to both a camera and a flow meter on his keg. And whenever somebody would um, come up to the keg, it would detect that motion, figure out who it was, and then charge them based on the amount of beer that they poured out. Um, you can use similar things to what I'll show you here um, on something like that. Um, also, I'll show at the end of this presentation um, the uh, link to where this presentation is. Um, and then you can actually, uh, if you go 
press down in the presentation, you'll um, find some code to work on uh, using your own computer camera um, rather than train videos. So I'm going to get started. Apparently not get started. Oh. OK. Don't touch it. OK. <laughs> Um, so everything that I'm going to work off of in this presentation really start is in this for loop, which hopefully you can see. Um, so I'm just going to kind of walk through what this for loop is doing. It's basically taking a list of um, frames. The list is called original. Um, and it's, for each frame, it is um, using the IAM show function from OpenCV to put that frame into a window and broadcast it. Um, and then this if clause, um, the wait key actually allows um, the computer to wait and be for a key to be pressed. And if you press the Q, it'll actually break you out of this for loop. But more importantly, it, it introduces a delay that allows the video to play at human speed rather than computer speed. Um, and then afterwards, you destroy the window um, or close it. So I'm going to work off of this for loop basically as we go through the algorithm um, that we developed. And then everything that I show in the IM show, I will then show in video afterwards. So if you were to run this, you would get this video to play. There's the cow train. You're going to get a lot of this clip for the rest of this presentation. Um, so the three main steps for this algorithm are, first of all, let's figure out, is something moving? OK, if, it is, if there is something moving, is that a train? or train-like. And then if it is a train, in what direction is it moving? Um, so I'm going to go through these three steps. So first of all, is something moving? So this is kind of your classic motion detection, um, a lot of times called background subtraction, figuring out basically developing a model of the background that you have in your um, view of your camera, and then identifying when there are pixels that are not fitting in that background. Um, so to develop a model of the background, we're first going to do a little pre-processing of the video. So first of all, um, each frame, when you have a color figure, um, each pixel is represented by three numbers. Usually, um, the intensity of the red, green, and blue in that pixel um, combined to get the color that you want. Um, this is more information than we need for motion detection, so we're actually going to convert the um, image to one channel, or grayscale or gray frame, or grayscale. <laughs> and we're going to do that using the convert color um, function here. Um, and so then we're just going to insert this now in that for loop that I showed you before. Um, and now we will output the gray video. Same video, just gray. Um, OK, before you freak out, there won't be as much math as this in the rest of the presentation. Um, but the next step is to smooth the image. So basically, um, you know, depending on the camera, you'll have a lot of noise in the image, high frequency parts that you don't want to show up when you're looking for motion detection because they will kind of throw off um, the rest of the algorithm. So one way to kind of reduce the noise is to do a Gaussian blur. And what that basically does is it, um, for each pixel, it actually represents that pixel as a weighted average of that pixel and then also the pixels in its neighborhood. Um, and kind of in a bell curve-like manner, everything that's closer will be weighted more heavily than things that are further apart. And so in OpenCV, you can use this Gaussian blur function. And what you are um, inputting here is the size of the kernel, or basically how big the neighborhood is around that pixel that you want to look at. Um, so hypothetically, you could do a Gaussian blur, and it really would average all the pixels. Um, but after a certain distance, um, they're really very low weighted. So you can kind of reduce the computational um, load um, by kind of choosing this kernel size. And if you uh, put the standard deviation as 0, it will calculate it based on um, an algorithm that it has. So, this is an example of just different kernel sizes being used. Um, so we're just kind of, as we go to the right and then down, we're increasing the neighborhood that is being um, used to develop that pixel. 
Um, so as you can see, once you get to kind of a very large neighborhood, you're really blurring out a lot of the features. Um, so for this uh, work, we're going to, so basically figuring out which kernel size or what kernel size you want to use is, is kind of a um, trial and error. It's dependent on the camera um, and also the application, um, how s small scale things do you want to kind of remove from the figure or not. Um, so here's our for loop again, and now we're just going to uh, put in the smooth frame um, line here and calculate the new smooth frame um, and then output it here. So now we've kind of gotten rid of some of the um, high frequency details, um, and that will allow us to kind of create a smoother idea of the background of this figure. So the last thing we do to create the model of the background is to calculate a running average. And so what the running average does is it has a weighted, makes a weighted average of the prior frames, and it weights kind of the more recent frame the most heavily. Right? So what we're doing is we're saying the running average at time t is um, part the prior running average and part this new frame, f. And so it's really controlled by this parameter alpha. So if our alpha were, say, 0.2, um, then we'd be taking 20% of the new frame, 80% of the prior running average, and kind of combining them um, to create the new running average. And so what this kind of does is it almost smooths it over in time so that you um, can update, say, if your light changes or the background changes for some reason, you can update, update that over time. Um, but no kind of small uh, frequency uh, changes are going to um, hurt your background model um, too bad. So to do that in Python, you use the accumulate, accumulate weighted function. Um, and just to note here, uh, we do have to convert the frame to um, a float to be able to kind of um, average in, uh, those numbers and get, get them out of the integer. So this is kind of the most code I'll be adding at one time. We want to define our um, alpha value, um, initialize the running average. If the first frame, if it's the first frame, then we're just going to make that the running average and build off of that. Um, and then otherwise, we will be just adding the new frame to um, our current running average. And so now we will see kind of the idea of the background over time. What you'll see is something that looks like a ghost train. Um, so you're getting still a lot of that background from the um, before the train there, um, and then some of the train uh, added in. So now we want to kind of, for every new frame, identify whether um, there's some motion in that frame or if there's anything new in that figure compared to the background. Um, so if we kind of take for an example these two figures, we want to take their difference and then see where they're different. Um, and so we can do this with the absdiff function. Um, and what you'll get is a, something that looks like this. Um, and so you'll see that there's still some um, motion kind of seen with the trees wrestling, um, but the, the brunt of it is um, with the train. Um, so here is that and put into our for loop. And then we can now see the video of the train. So we would love to not pick up all of those um, trees and call them a train. Um, so what we want to do is kind of threshold this image and say when there's enough change from our background, then we'll consider it something that's actually in motion. So with those trees, because they've been in the running average back and forth, their variation's not going to be as great as, say, when the train is coming in at first. Um, so we can pick a value to um, threshold and make um, anything above that value something that's in motion. Um, and so that can be done with this threshold function. Um, and we can see now that we can reduce a lot of um, but not all, but a lot of the motion. So you'll notice that, um, well, 
actually, let's go to here. So we've now identified places of movement, um, but now we've got to figure out, is that moving thing a train? Um, so one way to look at this is, um, is enough of the frame actually in motion to be considered something that's as big as a train, right? So if we um, look at the fraction of this frame that's actually considered in motion over time, we can plot that frame or that fraction over time. Um, and so here you have, um, right when the train comes in, you have a lot of motion detected. Um, and then as it starts passing, we actually have um, a reduced amount of motion, and that's because the train kind of all looks the same. So when you're taking that difference, it actually isn't showing too much motion except for where those windows are. Um, so this is kind of an issue that's fairly unique to this problem. Usually if you're doing motion detection and you're looking at kind of a car passing or a person, they don't take up the whole frame and they don't really stay taking up the whole frame. Um, so it actually becomes a lot um, easier for those kinds of problems. Um, but you do still see that motion. Um, and so what you can do is kind of create a threshold for, is there enough motion to be considered something that's train-like? Um, but the thing is, is there's also a parking lot right between us and the train, and then right behind the train there's a little like commuter subway. Um, so, and then there's also a freight train uh, that also goes by. So we want to make sure that that big moving thing is really kind of fits our idea of what the train is. And so we can do that by saying, is it also long enough to um, represent a train? Um, so by kind of having these two thresholds, we can now kind of identify trains um, over time. But what can we say about the direction of the train? It doesn't really help if we don't know if the train is going north or south, because we won't be able to identify which train it is. So what we can do in this case is use the fact that if um, a train is coming southbound, it's going to enter from the left of the frame before, um, and if it's going northbound, we'll enter from the uh, right. So what we can actually do is, instead of looking at the whole frame for motion, we can look at two um, regions of interest, or ROIs, um, and then monitor those separately, and then see when one um, kind of the train comes into before the other. So now if we kind of spoiled the fun there, um, if we monitor the fraction of motion within each of these squares. I don't know if they're showing up very well. They're right here and then right here. Then you see that the left side ROI picks up the train um, a couple of frames before the right. Um, and, so, and then the right ROI stays with motion longer um, than the left as it's leaving the frame. Um, and so that allows us to figure out what direction it's going in. Um, so there's a few different ways that you could do this. I've just been using a um, small data frame the size of kind of our, uh, what we've developed is the length of a train. Um, and then once that um, data frame is full of having detected uh, a train at least in one side for the whole length, um, we can figure out which side um, has, has that side detected longer, um, which allows us to then detect the direction of the train. So that's kind of the algorithm in a nutshell. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can deploy this um, and use it in real time. So we have um, put this on a Raspberry Pi. So this is the setup that we've used. Um, we have actually used the GoPro mount because it's very um, easy to install and have move around. Um, this is a reminder. We have a microphone also, so we also have a um, sound detection of the train as well as kind of a second um, signal when, when things can go awry. Um, and then mainly we're using this Pi camera, uh, which has no infrared filter. So when I did this project, I learned a little bit about infrared photography. So apparently a camera can typically actually pick up infrared um, wavelengths, and so Without an IR filter, you get interesting photography like this. Um, and basically, it's wavelengths that we aren't able to see typically with our eyes. Um, so typically, we'll put an IR filter in there to re remove those so that things look normal to us. Um, but actually, at night, um, when you stop, stop seeing the visible uh, waves from 
during the, um, when it's dark, uh, you can still actually still pick up on those infrared signals and still get the motion detection um, working for a number of hours longer than if you had actually kept it, uh, kept the IR filter in. Um, and so this is just a few example um, uh, pieces of code from the Pi camera package. It allows you to, from your laptop, um, change the resolution, the frame rate, uh, the brightness, and the contrast. Um, so the Raspberry Pi is really easy to use for this um, function. And then um, it's very easy to implement this algorithm. Basically, you just set up the Pi camera to bring in the um, images as a stream, and or as a stream of ND, uh, NumPy, ND arrays, which um, are what OpenCV uh, use their figures as. Um, and so then this is just where your uh, algorithm would come in, and you would just have this running um, regularly. So video quality considerations. Um, so the Raspberry Pi is really great because it is uh, cheap. We can kind of deploy it um, easily, uh, but it is very small, um, and it has limited storage and computational power. So you may want to reduce both, say, the resolution and the frame rate of your um, camera to be able to really be able to run this um, in real time. So I'm just going to talk about um, kind of what the effects of changing the frame rate and the resolution are on some of the parameters that we were talking about. So just as a recap, um, we used the uh, kernel size to figure out how much you wanted to smooth that image. Um, we used a threshold to figure out how much motion means in uh, a train is in motion. Um, we used that alpha value to figure out how heavily we should weight each new frame in the background model. Um, and we used a kind of a length of the train um, to be able to detect it as a train and not anything else. So if we think about changing the resolution and um, uh, the parameter of the kernel size, the kernel size is really saying how big a neighborhood you want to consider in kind of averaging this new pixel value. Um, so you can imagine if you reduce the resolution, um, you're actually going to also want to reduce um, in kind the uh, size of the kernel. Otherwise, you're going to be taking, you know, tree leaves, uh, kernels, or tree leaves, pixels um, for the train, et cetera. Um, oops. So this is an example of um, kind of the original frame, and then I took a, a down sample, so an eighth of the resolution. Um, and so our original kernel size was 31. Um, and our new one here is 3. Um, and it does a pretty good job of reproducing it. Um, we can't completely divide by 8. Your kernel size has to be odd, because it needs to have that middle kernel um, to have the uh, main intensity be for that original pixel. So another thing to consider is the threshold on kind of what is considered motion. So when you start reducing the resolution, um, you're not having as many pixels um, make up the same area of motion or non-motion. Um, and so that may affect how much is going to end up um, coming out as being in motion um, when you run your algorithm. So in this case, we actually have to lower that threshold because it is not picking up as much motion in those um, ROIs because it's just not, um, it's not delineating it as well as when you had many more pixels. And then, so that was kind of talking about the resolutions. Now thinking about frame rate. So frame rate is the number of frames per second that are going to be taken um, when you're uh, running your camera. Um, and so, if you remember, when we were creating that running average, we want to know how heavily to um, weigh in each new frame. Now, if you reduce your frame rate, that new frame is kind of representing a longer period of time um, than it was previously. Um, and so, you can also think of the running average as, or the alpha controlling how long of a history you're remembering in your model of the background. Um, and so, you may want to weight heavier, more heavily, um, each new frame if you have a lower frame rate um, so that it is taking up the same amount of time kind of in that history. Um, so just as kind of a crude back of the envelope, a lot of math, sorry. Um, 
if you were to have your frame rate and kind of considered almost waiting um, each new frame twice, you would end up having about, rather, our original alpha was about 0.2, and it becomes about 0.36 um, afterwards. Then this one's kind of obvious. The history length, uh, if we're looking at the number of frames that it lasts, um, is going to change. This is kind of what our original um, fraction of motion looked like over time. And then here's what it looks like um, in terms of frame number when we reduce that frame rate. So you're going to want to adjust um, your frame accordingly. Um, another option is, I know that in deployment, we actually ended up having kind of variable frame rate. Um, depending on a few factors. And so um, you could also have it as a function of, uh, of time, kind of your time stamps of these frames rather than frame number is another way of doing it. And then lastly, um, this is kind of the one limitation to how much you can reduce your frame rate. And that is you need, for this problem, for the direction detection, you need for one, the train to be able to um, move from the one ROI to the other ROI um, in uh, enough time to be able to get a, um, a snapshot of before it reaches the, the further ROI. Um, and so that's a function of how fast the thing you're trying to detect is moving, how wide your um, camera is looking, and then your frame rate as well. Um, so that's definitely one limitation. So lastly, um, what if the light changes? So what I showed you as background subtraction was kind of called frame differencing. Um, and so it's good for the indoors. Um, it does adjust to the light as your, run, as your average is changing over time. But you may get kind of a wider or, um, uh, or a smaller kind of range of uh, differences and intensities of those pixels. And so that threshold that we um, cut off the difference at may change um, if the lighting changes. Um, and so you could train a different threshold for maybe by time or brightness or intensity. Um, you could have different modes for um, different uh, brightnesses or intensities. But there's also other options for background subtraction um, that are more adaptive. Um, and I don't have time to go through it here, but they are, there are extra slides in this presentation if you'd like to learn more. Um, that kind of looks at each pixel and creates kind of a statistical distribution of what it thinks that pixel might be. Um, and then when you get too far out of that distribution, you will um, call it motion. Um, and as I showed before, the Pi camera is very easy to change the brightness and contrast, and that can really help also with these issues. So thank you. Um, yeah. okay. We actually have just a couple minutes if anyone has any questions. If you could please come up to the mic to ask them so everyone can hear. So I'm actually working on a, a very similar project and Judging by some of your code, I assume we probably learned how to do this from the same place. Um, <laughs> so instead of lowering the resolution, um, I built mine around um, three, Python 3.5 with uh, async I.O. Have you guys looked into that all, at all to get a better resolution? Sorry, I couldn't actually hear what um, you were looking into. Um, have you thought about moving to Python 3.5 and using async I.O. so you don't have to lower your resolution as much? Um, I haven't personally, because I got put on another project, um, but we do have other coworkers of mine looking at the more computationally efficient, but I will pass that on to them for sure. Thank you. So at the end of all this, what's your uh, error rate for detecting the train? Are you aware of that? Uh, we haven't gotten that for the whole, um, I don't have any good numbers for you. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you detecting trains in just one spot or more than one? Currently just one spot. We do have like, we're in talks with people that we know who are also along the tracks. Um, maybe crowdsourcing the Caltrain will happen, but, but right now it's just one place. So related to the question of uh, error rate, I, I happen to know that some freight trains do come through where Caltrain normally does. Do you have any sort of way to uh, disambiguate the two? Yeah, um, so that 
length of um, kind of how long does it have to be to be a train. You can also limit that as it can't be longer than that to be a train either. Um, so we actually just cap it on if it's longer than a certain distance, or basically longer than a certain length of a train, then we'll cut it off. The freight trains are actually much louder too. You can hear those in the office. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I had a question, uh, kind of following that, except for my use case was more of a, a, a shuttle, but there's also trucks and buses. So uh, what are your thoughts as far as the length uh, working in that case, since there might be a truck that might be the same length as the shuttle that we'd want to... Sorry, was the question if there were shuttles going? And, and the environment that I would want to use. Yeah, there might be other vehicles that might be. Yeah, so I think, that. again, that that amount of time you have to have motion in so many frames to not be a shuttle. Yeah, we definitely have that problem. We have the FedEx bus going by each time. Um, and it's just making sure that and there's motion for enough time to not be considered that. Because if the shuttle were to stop, then you'd stop seeing motion or it would go by fast enough not to be an issue. Um, if you had a generic, uh, like just a webcam in, connected to your Pi, how do you, how do you, um, how do you get the info from the video without like doing uh, frame and saving it to disk and frame and saving it to disk? Like how do you stream? Yeah, so um, the code that I showed that um, is the Pi camera package. That will actually just pull it straight from the camera into the Python environment, and then you can do the processing before you're saving it. So you're pulling one frame, doing everything, and then you can get rid of it, basically. And then you're just keeping that running average um, frame continuously. So all the development was on the Pi and not like a, on, and not on um, like a webcam? Um, oh, for the actual algorithm development, I was doing it kind of with clips, and I had myself kind of figuring out all the, mm -hmm. the functions with the webcam, which you could use from the other slides. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that kind of goes with my second question. What, um, how would you get those images and output them to, like, those images that were the intermediate results that you showed on the slide? How would I get them out, like, in real time? Yeah, like that video that showed the black and white uh, shapes of them. Um, I, get, I mean, you could just save the frame within that, that loop, but you probably wouldn't want to. Um, I think this was just to kind of show each step, but I think in real time, um, I mean, you could definitely save it out, but I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, all the time we have for it. Thank you again. And um, I'm sure if you have other questions, you can ask those after.